Now let's turn to a third major area of disagreement among the varying schools of macroeconomics, the use of policy rules or discretion. This discussion follows naturally from the debates over the causes of macroeconomic instability, whether such instability is self-correcting, and how long it takes for the self-correction to take place. Here is how the debate is often framed. From the monetarist and new classical perspective, should the government adhere to policy rules which prohibit it from causing instability in an economy that would otherwise be stable? From the Keynesian view, should the government use discretionary fiscal and monetary policy when needed to stabilize a sometimes unstable economy? And from the supply side view, should the government pursue discretionary policies to increase aggregate supply as a way of increasing output and reducing inflationary pressures? Let's start with the monetarist and new classical arguments in support of policy rules for the conduct of monetary policy and balancing the budget. The purpose of such rules is to prevent government from trying to manage aggregate demand. In this view, such management is misguided and thus likely to cause more instability than it cures. For the monetarist, the enactment of a monetary rule makes the most sense. This is because monetarists believe inappropriate monetary policy is the major source of macroeconomic instability. Such a rule would direct the Federal Reserve to expand the money supply each year at the same annual rate as the typical growth of the economy's production capacity. The Fed's sole monetary rule would then be to use tools such as open market operations, changes in the reserve requirement, and discount rate changes to ensure that the nation's money supply grows steadily by, say, 3 to 5 percent a year. According to the father of monetarism, Milton Friedman, such a rule would eliminate the major cause of instability in the economy, the capricious and unpredictable impact of countercyclical monetary policy. This figure helps illustrate the rationale for a monetary rule. Here, we assume that the economy is operating at a full employment real output of Q1. We also assume that the nation's long-run aggregate supply curve shifts rightward each year as from ASLR1 to ASLR2. This shift depicts the average annual potential increase in real output. Now, the monetarist monetary rule would tie increases in the money supply to the typical rightward shift of long-run aggregate supply. In view of the direct link between changes in the money supply and aggregate demand, this would ensure that the AD curve shifts rightward, as from AD1 to AD2 each year. As a result, real GDP would rise from Q1 to Q2, and the price level would remain constant at P1. In this view, a monetary rule would promote steady growth of real output along with price stability. Generally, new classical rational expectations economists also support a monetary rule. They conclude that an easy or tight money policy will alter the rate of inflation, but not real output. For example, suppose the Federal Reserve implements an easy money policy to reduce interest rates, expand investment spending, and boost real GDP. On the basis of past experience and economic knowledge, the public will anticipate that this policy is inflationary and take self-protective action. Workers will press for higher wages, firms will increase product prices, and lenders will raise their nominal interest rates. While these responses are designed to prevent inflation from having adverse effects on real incomes of workers, businesses, and lenders, the collective impact is to immediately raise wage and price levels. This offsets the increase in aggregate demand brought about by easy money, so real output and employment do not expand. But wages and prices do.